time. I think that's the way this gets solved. Uh, our next presenter is Dr. Chris Palmer. Uh, Dr. Palmer is a Harvard-trained psychiatrist, researcher, and author of The Brain Energy, where he explores a groundbreaking connection between metabolic health and mental illness. He is a leader in innovative approaches to treating psychiatric conditions, advocating for the use of diet and metabolic interventions to improve mental health outcomes. Dr. Palmer's work is reshaping how the medical field views and treats mental health disorders. Dr. Palmer. Thank you. <clears throat> Senator Johnson, uh, Mr. Kennedy, and distinguished guests, uh, it's really an honor to be here. Uh, I want to build on what Dr. Means just shared, that these chronic diseases we face today, obesity, diabetes, fatty liver, all share something in common. They are, in fact, metabolic dysfunction. I'm going to go into a little bit of the science just to make sure we're all on the same page. Although most people think of metabolism as burning calories, it is far more than that. Metabolism is a series of chemical reactions that convert food into energy and building blocks essential for cellular health. When we have metabolic dysfunction, it can drive numerous chronic diseases, which is a paradigm shift in the medical field. Now, there is no doubt metabolism is complicated. It really is. It is influenced by biological, psychological, environmental, and social factors. And the medical field says this complexity is the reason we can't solve the obesity epidemic. Because they're still trying to understand every molecular detail of biology. But in fact, we don't need to understand biology in order to understand the cause. The cause is coming from our environment, a toxic environment like poor diet and exposure to harmful chemicals. And these are actually quite easy to study, understand, and address. There is no doubt food plays a key role. It provides the substrate for energy and building blocks. Nutritious foods support metabolism, while ultra-processed options can disrupt it. It is shocking that today in 2024, the FDA allows food manufacturers to introduce brand new chemicals into our food supply without adequate testing. The manufacturers are allowed to determine for themselves whether this substance is safe for you and your family to eat or not. Metabolism's impact goes beyond physical health. I am a psychiatrist. Some of you are probably wondering, why are you here? <laughs> it also affects mental health. Because guess what? The human brain is an organ too. And when brain metabolism is impaired, it can cause symptoms that we call mental illness. It is no coincidence that as the rates of obesity and diabetes are skyrocketing, so too are the rates of mental illness. In case you didn't know, we have a mental health crisis. We have all-time all prevalence highs for depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder, deaths of despair, drug overdoses, ADHD, and autism. What does the mental health field have to say for this? Well, you know, mental illness is just chemical imbalances or maybe trauma and stress. That is wholly insufficient to explain the epidemic that we are seeing. And in fact, there is a better way to integrate the biopsychosocial factors known to play a role in mental illness. Mental disorders at their core are often metabolic disorders impacting the brain. It's not surprising to most people that obesity and diabetes might play a role in depression or anxiety. But the rates of autism have quadrupled in just 20 years and the rates of ADHD have tripled over that same period of time. 
These are neurodevelopmental disorders. And many people are struggling to understand how on earth could they rise so rapidly. But it turns out that metabolism plays a profound role in neurodevelopment. And sure enough, parents with metabolic issues like obesity and diabetes are more likely to have children with autism and ADHD. This is not about fat shaming. Because what I am arguing is that the same foods and chemicals and other drivers of obesity that are causing obesity in the parents are affecting the brain health of our children. There is compelling evidence that food plays a direct role in mental health. One study of nearly 300,000 people found that those who eat ultra-processed foods daily are three times more likely to struggle with their mental health than people who never or rarely consume them. A systematic review found direct associations between ultra-processed food exposure and 32 different health parameters, including mental health mental health conditions. Now, I'm not here to say that food is the only or even primary driver of mental illness. Let's go back to something familiar. Trauma and stress do drive mental illness. But for those of you who don't know, trauma and stress are also associated with increased rates of obesity and diabetes. Trauma and stress change human metabolism. We need to put the science together. This brings me to a key point. We cannot separate physical and mental health from metabolic health. Addressing metabolic dysfunction has the potential to prevent and treat a wide range of chronic diseases. This is not just theoretical. We've just heard from Michaela Peterson Fuller, Dr. Peterson, in my own work, I have seen firsthand how using metabolic therapies like the ketogenic diet and other dietary interventions can improve even severe mental illnesses like schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, sometimes putting them into lasting remission. These reports are published in peer-reviewed prestigious medical journals. However, there is a larger issue at play that many have talked about. Medical education and public health recommendations are really captured by industry and politics. And at best, they often rely on weak epidemiological data, resulting in conflicting or even harmful advice. We heard an, a, a reference to this but in case you didn't know, a long time ago, we demonized saturated fat. And what was the consequence of demonizing saturated fat? We replaced it with healthy vegetable shortening. That was the phrase we used, healthy vegetable shortening. Guess what was in that healthy vegetable shortening? It was filled with trans fats which are now recognized to be so harmful that they've been banned in the United States. Let's not repeat mistakes like this. So what's the problem? Number one, nutrition and mental health research are severely underfunded, with each of them getting less than 5% of the NIH budget. This is no accident. This is the concerted effort of lobbying by industry, food manufacturers, the healthcare industry. They do not want root causes discovered. We need to get back to funding research on the root causes of mental and metabolic disorders, including the effects of foods, chemicals, medications, environmental toxins on the human brain and metabolism. We stand here at a crossroads. We can continue managing symptoms and watching this crisis worsen, or we can choose a new path, 
one that addresses the root causes of mental and metabolic disorders. The time to act is now for the sake of our citizens, our children, and our nation's future. Let's work together to address this chronic disease epidemic. Thank you. I, I want to start by making a comment on the, uh, the mention that Dr. McCary uh, did about the Pima Indians. I spent about 20% of my career working on issues for Native Americans, indigenous people in Canada and Latin America. And the Pima example is a really good example. On the reservations today, which suffered more than any other population, and the highest COVID death rates in our country, suffer from chronic disease more than any other population. And it's common to call, uh, to, to characterize as white death, white sugar, white flour, and white Crisco oil, which is, poison, is, is committing, the, is ending the genocide of, the, uh, the, uh, of Native Americans in this country. It's the completion of that genocide. The Pima Indians are actually a perfect natural experiment because on the Mexican side of the border, they're not getting those. And the Pimas there are long-lived. They're just slim. They don't have diabetes. And on our side, 90% of them are obese, very short-lived. I think the, the longevity is something like 47 years, although I have to check that, but very, very close to that. And, uh, and it's a natural experiment that shows the danger of ultra-processed foods. Um, Dr. Palmer, uh, the uh, mitochondrial disorder affects every organ of the body. And the brain is an organ of the body. And, uh, but the brain actually has a lot more difficult uh, job of excreting these kind of toxins than the, the other organs. Can you talk about that and also talk about the fact that about 0.5% in recent studies of the, American, of the American brains are now made up of microplastics. So 0.5% of the weight of our brains are now microplastics, and that's something we should all be worried about. Yeah. The, um, so thank you for the question. The the issue of microplastics and nanoplastics in the human body is, is actually, sadly, in its infancy. We have two publications out in the last couple of months demonstrating that microplastics are in fact found in the human brain. Um, and as Dr. Mean said, and you cited, 0.5% of the body weight, or the brain's weight appears to be composed of microplastics. We need more research to better understand whether these microplastics are in fact associated with harmful conditions because microplastics are now ubiquitous. So some will argue, well, they're everywhere and everybody's got them and it's just a benign thing. Some will argue that. The most compelling evidence against that is a study published in the New England Journal of Medicine a few months ago now, in which they were doing routine carotid endarterectomies, taking plaque out of people's carotid arteries, um, just routinely doing that for clinical care. And then they analyzed those plaques for microplastics. 58% of the people had detectable microplastics in the plaques. So they compared this 58% group who had microplastics to the ones who didn't, followed them for three years, just three years, and the ones who had microplastics had four times the mortality. There is strong reason to believe, based on animal data and based on cell biology data, that microplastics are in fact toxic to the human body, to mitochondrial function, to hormone dysregulation and all sorts of things. There, there are lots of reasons to believe that. Um, but 
the scientists will say we need more research, we need to better understand whether they re these microplastics really are associated with higher rates of disease. I think people are terrified of the answer. People are terrified of the answer. And if you think about everything that you consume and how much of it is not wrapped in plastic, all of those industries are going to oppose research. They are going to oppose research funding to figure this out ASAP. Because that will be a monumental change to not just the food industry, but our entire economy. Clean, imagining just cleaning up the oceans and trying to get this plastic. And then more importantly, trying to figure out how are we going to detox humans? How are we going to deplasticize human beings? How are we going to get these things out? It is an enormous problem, but the reality is putting our heads in the sand is not going to help. And I am really hopeful that by raising issues and letting people know about this health crisis that maybe we will get answers quickly. I've got a... You mentioned that people are afraid to find the answer. Uh, you also mentioned an issue of which we're not supposed to even ask questions because people are afraid of the answer, and that was autism. And while we have another psychologist at the table, Dr. Peterson, I'd like you to just, I guess, uh, speculate on why is it, why, I understand why industry probably doesn't want to find the root cause of, of autism, but why don't our federal health agencies seem to have any curiosity whatsoever of trying to find, you know, this, this is, again, I, I don't know the exact stats, uh, it's kind of hard to find the, the one in 10,000 or whatever, but you know, we know now, one in 36, Children in America, one in 22 in California. Uh, I mean, I can't imagine being a parent of a severely autistic person, okay? Um, I, I certainly wouldn't want to be somebody manufacturing vaccines and uh, all of a sudden finding out that, boy, they may be contributing. But just, I mean, I see Del Bigtree here who's done so much fabulous work and trying to raise public awareness. <laughs> But, but I'll, go ba I'll go back to your afraid to find the answer. Can you just talk about that, and Dr. Peterson? I'd like to hear your thoughts on that as well. I, you know, your, your question is, why are our health agencies not exploring these questions? It's because the health agencies are largely influenced by the industries they are supposed to be regulating and looking out for. The medical education community is, is, con is largely controlled by pharmaceutical companies. One and a half billion dollars goes to support, one and a half billion dollars every year goes to support physician education. That's from pharmaceutical companies, one and a half billion from pharmaceutical companies. So physicians are getting educated with some influence, large influence, I would argue, by them. The health organizations, it's a political issue. The NIH, it's politics. Politicians are selecting people to be on the committees or people to oversee these organizations. Politicians rely on donations from uh, companies and supporters to get reelected. And the reality is this is not going to be easy to tackle. The, the challenge is that you'll get ethical politicians who say, I'm not going to take any of that money, and I'm going to try to do the right thing. And right now, the way the system is set up, there's a good chance those politicians won't get reelected. And instead, they're... Their opponents, who were more than happy to take millions of dollars in campaign contributions, will get reelected, and then they will return the favor to their noble campaign donors. We are at a crossroads. We have to decide who are the constituents of the American government. 
Is it industry or is it the American people? So, so Dr. Peterson, I mean, first of all, do you agree with the premise of the question based on what Dr. Palmer said, that we're just afraid to find the answer? Do you agree with that? And if so, why? Well, someone has to decide which of the infinite number of facts scientists might concentrate on. And exactly how that process of facilitating hypothesis generation and inquiry occurs isn't exactly known. Why do scientists study what they study? Well, some of it is what they're interested in, some of it is what bothers their conscience, and a fair bit of it is what, what would you say, what is provided to the scientific community as direction from, let's say, policymakers and the community. And so one of the things we're trying to do here, in the broadest possible sense, which is why I opened my remarks with the more broad reference to philosophy of science is, well, someone has to establish the aims. You know, you saw American science tilt in the STEM direction remarkably in the 1960s when the moon was the aim, for example, right? When we were concerned about, when we were concerned about Russian domination of the, of the technical enterprise. Um, the, political, the political field and the cultural field set the stage that defines the targets of inquiry for, especially for the incremental scientists who are mostly chasing research funding, for example. So it's up to, it's up to the political leaders to determine what the priorities are. That, that's the diagnostic issue that I was referring to. Like, what are the problems here? And that's a hard thing, right? To, if, if, if I had to say to you, what are the five most significant problems that beset the United States currently? That's a very difficult question to answer, but it has to be done at the level of political leadership. It, it is, but within health, I think it's a pretty simple uh, proposition to say that, you know, this rise in autism is a serious problem that ought to be looked at, and we don't. Again, it's, it's off limits. You can't even ask the question. It's just like, oh, it just happened. But anyway, yeah. I, I, I think we do have to move on here. Um, the, the next presenter, we're going a little out of order again, but uh, Callie Means. Uh